working in the technology industry. Sandra worked at IBM for over 10 years serving in product management and corporate training roles. In 2010, Sandra founded Pivotal Expert in Singapore to develop games to help users practice high-tech skills. Chris Bosch is currently an Associate Professor of Information Systems in Education at Singapore Management University where he teaches courses on cloud computing, big data and analytics and architecture analysis. He is passionate about the evolution of cloud computing and its potential to enhance the field of education. Please join me in welcoming Sandra and Chris Bosch. Excellent. Well, good morning. Um, I'm Sandra. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and I know that maybe in the morning you might not want someone really high energy and bubbly, but I am Latin, so I will try to tone it down. Um, but just just know who you're, you're, you might be getting. <laughs> Into, yeah. And, and I'm Chris, yes. Okay, so three and a half years ago, I uh, decided to do the unthinkable, to build a game for programmers. And I was really, really excited. So my experience at startups and at IBM for years was I saw the despair and agony of programmers when they had to, um, because management said, uh, learn a new language to do a new project, or most horribly, uh, we had acquired a new company at IBM, we did that a lot, and they had to grab a bunch of code from uh, uh, one product and bring it into portfolio. So the agony and pain of them having to freshen up on skills that maybe they knew before and they had forgotten, or they had to learn a new pro you know programming language really quickly. So what I wanted to do was make a platform to make this easier and fun. And that's what we did. We built SyncPath. Yeah, and about that same time, I uh, started learning Python. Google had just come out with Google App Engine for Python. And in order to play with Google App Engine, you had to learn Python. So that's my first introduction to Python. And I fell in love very quickly. A very nice, uh, elegant language. And so we were getting ready to launch something. And then we had a friend of ours named Danny, who was a high school math teacher in Singapore. And he was getting ready to teach Python to his high school class. And so it sounded like a lot of what Sandra was trying to do and what he wanted was the same. And so I started working with uh, Danny, and, and Danny was really looking to let his uh, weaker students practice uh, more easy problems, and some students would show up already knowing how to code in one language, and so they needed more advanced problems. And if you, if you look at the learning theory, there's this idea of mastery learning, which is if you learn the basics really well before you introduce another concept, you get a lot better learning outcomes. And it's not quite as good as if you had like a personal tutor for every student, but mastery learning will get you about halfway according to uh, Bloom's research. So this is a great idea when Bloom first published this research, so a lot of people started to try it in the classroom, but it turns out back then it was very hard. We didn't have computers in the classroom, and if you were a teacher, taking a mastery learning approach pretty much meant that you had to instruct your students on some topic, and then you had to assess all of your students, and then the ones who had mastered the topic, you had to give them these enrichment exercises, and the students that didn't quite get it, you had to reteach them, maybe correct some things, then assess them again. So as you might imagine, in a classroom of 40 or more students, this could get very complex very quickly. Uh, but by building a, a game or doing something online, this started to get a little bit uh, simpler. So we put up our first version. So right, in December of 2009, we built something, as people do, and it ended up being a really cool framework. It basically met what the goal was. We had problems, which are right in the top, and then we had a box where people could answer the problems, and then we had verifiers to evaluate the code and make sure that it passed all the unit tests that we had. So I was really excited. Um, it was very different, though, because the needs for my, what my mind was for the programmers that I had worked with for years and the needs of Danny's students were very different. Yeah, so the nice thing is not too much Python code written in Django, deployed to Google App Engine, up and running uh, pretty quickly without a, a lot of effort, but, but making the content had a different challenge, because when you're creating content to help people learn, there's this other idea that Bloom came up with called the Bloom's Taxonomy, which is you want people thinking and solving problems at higher and higher levels of thinking. So in the beginning, you might just be memorizing things like this is an integer, this is a string, uh, but then eventually you want to be taking those concepts you 
learned and applying them in a new area. And then eventually you want people to be able to create brand new things from what they've learned. And as we got into the literature and we're also creating some problems, what we found is uh, your experience uh, really depended on your prior experience. So for instance, if someone had seen, if I asked you to create a function that subtracted one number from another, if you had seen that exact function before, you might have just memorized that answer and you could just type in the same thing. So then you would just be remembering. But if you had seen how to add two numbers together with a simple Python function, very, very short, very elegant, then creating the subtract function is actually more of applying knowledge that you have before. And then yet someone else could show up and all, if all they knew was there was this rough idea of functions and there was this operand, the plus operand, then creating the subtract function for them might actually be a task of uh, creation. So uh, we, we kept creating more problems and kept trying to find those perfect problems and, and we found that it really depended on the user. So we had great contact and context and it was great because we had like, um, like four or five thousand people playing and we hadn't actually launched anything and we had people playing in 25 countries and we really hadn't done any advertising or communicated to anybody. Um, so it was really great. It was working. But it was missing a key element. I didn't think it was fun. I mean, it's really cool. I mean, it's, it's fun to write code and it's fun to solve problems and that's great. But I wanted to add a little bit more fun to it because I because coding is cool. So I wanted to provide a really fun environment for people. So what we did was we made badges um, so that you could get a badge if you were doing in a level or if you, you had finished a special language or if you had mastery of a special area, you would get badges. Um, you could also do a completion matrix. So we would give you an idea of where you were at any given point. So in a given level, if you had answer 9 out of 15, it was very clear to you. So uh, if you wanted to complete things and that's who you are, that would motivate you a little bit to complete the, the entire level. Or if there's 50 questions, you've done 50 questions out of 75, hey, it's only five, 25 more questions, go ahead and complete that. Um, we also did rankings, because it's really cool to see how you measure up to other players. So if your buddy's playing and he's ahead of you, you might spend five more minutes coding it just a little bit more so you can just beat them, right? That's really fun. And also you could see your ranking for your country as well as, well as worldwide. Um, so that would give you an idea of where you measure up with other players other gamers worldwide, which is really neat. And then we had challenges, which is basically a secret message that you could unlock if you do a task, like maybe create a problem, etc., or if you do specific problems, if you solve problems. So as we started uh, delivering these features, uh, they were really great in the beginning because if, if people were going to play five more minutes just to get a badge or move up a ranking, well, we considered that a win, right? That's five minutes they were practicing a great skill like Python rather than playing Angry Birds or World of Warcraft. Bejeweled. Yeah. So, so all, all for that great things. But then you start to have this conversation that as you get into these game mechanics and you look at a lot of the research, the thing you want to watch out for is this sort of balance between intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. Uh, because it turns out a lot of the studies say that things that are fun pe people stay fun until you start forcing them to do them. So a child may love reading until you assign them lots of homework where they have to read things and then reading becomes like work, like a chore. Uh, the same thing goes for math and the same thing can go uh, for programming. So we started having this big conversation about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. And extrinsic, pretty obvious, it's what someone outside of you uh, wants you to do. Go earn a badge, unlock a challenge, something like that. But intrinsic motivation, that's that stuff that comes from within. So uh, one of the acronyms I always try to remember is AMP, A-M-P, which is this idea of autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So autonomy is a lot of people like to do things their own way, on their own time, using their own tools. Uh, mastery, people tend to want to get better at something and, and actually feel like they're getting better. And then there's this idea of purpose, that people want to be part of something bigger than themselves. Uh, they want to make their school better, their, their job, their, their workplace better. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out how do we extrinsically motivate people, but at the same time not sort of kill this intrinsic motivation. Uh, but, but it turns out that's really, really hard. Okay, so at the end of the day we said, you know what, let's just focus on the intrinsic, extrinsic motivation a little bit longer, a few more carrots and a few more sticks, and then we'll come back to the intrinsic motivation uh, later on. Right. So we did talk it to death. Um, but at the end of the day, we decided to finalize on what we basically had already. Uh, we have... Um, 
um, a section in the top where you, you have your question. You have a section in the bottom where you can write your code. And if you're familiar with unit tests, uh, basically if you write the correct code, it's going to give you green lights. If you write something incorrectly or it didn't pass one of the tests, it's going to give you red lights. Um, and a lot of people were actually solving this. They were, they were working on this. But what we wanted to do, we found a lot of people just, um, I had one guy, he hadn't done Python at all. And so in one weekend, he just did 150 problems in Python. And so I said, well, how was that? And he goes, it was great. It was interesting. I learned it. I feel like I can, I can code Python now. Um, but it, you know, it was OK. But he wasn't really excited. I'm like, oh, I could have made it a little bit more fun for him. Because uh, I want you to enjoy what you're doing. And so what we decided to do was do a story mode. And so we sent out our kids to do a Kickstarter project, which is called The Spy Who Coded. It's, it's, it's a first person coder. It's a first person coder. <laughs> And so uh, they went off, and what they did, they, they built a movie. It, it was a uh, collection of clips. And so now what we have, if you want to play in story mode, you can click the story mode. And after you uh, answer five, uh, five, six questions in Python, you get one of the clips. So it's like an award. You, you got one of the clips, and you're involved in the storyline, and you get to help them out. Um, and the story is that there's a bad, bad evil spy and they're trying to she is trying to hack a bank in Singapore across the bay this is Marina Bay in Singapore and the good uh, spy is trying to of course make sure that she doesn't do that and so uh, it's really fun and if you want to play please do so you can do it at lunch or at dinner tonight and let me know if you were the spy who coded so uh, a lot of this stuff was really moving us in the area of, of games, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, games do some things very well. They're good at sort of delivering this idea of fun. So another guy from the literature, uh, Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, he did a lot of great work on what did people consider fun. And it was like these basic elements. People like clear goals, this opportunity to concentrate, and they like immediate feedback. And, and, and another, when you do this right, people just sort of get into this uh, deep effortless involvement, and you sort of lose track of time. And if that's ever happened with you playing a game, uh, you know what I mean. And, and, but one of the really hard things about this is making your game so that it adapts to the player. Because if it's too boring, you'll quit. If it's frustrating, you'll quit. And so a really good game watches you, and it's continually assessing you, sort of like that teacher would do in mastery learning, right? Uh, but what you've got to do is balance this, because all people are different. So even right now, as I'm talking, some of you, we might be moving too quickly, and you're frustrated. It's like, what are they talking about? And others of you, you're already bored, so you're checking your email, right? So all I can sort of hope to do is keep that like 60 to 70% of you in the middle, keep you moving through this flow channel where you're highly engaged, and you're neither bored nor frustrated. But some of the consistent feedback that we got from players is no matter how easy we made the problems, some players would say, they're still too hard. I want more step by step. I want it incremental. And then other people would come along and say, this is so boring. It's, I, I'm, let me skip the easy problems. I want harder problems. I'm, I'm beyond the skill level. So what we did, we um, set up a mode for adaptive difficulty. So we have hard, medium, and easy. And so for programmers, they usually like the hard bit. They just really enjoy getting the hard problems and going through the hard. For students, they like the medium or easy. And the medium kind of adapts to your play. So depending on how long it takes you to answer a problem, etc., it kind of adapts to you. Uh, so that's quite cool. But what we found out is a lot of uh, students or adults who are just coming into Python or just beginning to, to learn how to code um, thought that the easy was a little too too hard for them. And so we came up with a new concept, and it's called drag and drop. And so drag and drop is a game that where you don't actually have to type any code, right? You're just basically playing a game, dragging uh, lines of code from the left to your right. And this was really cool because we found that a lot of people were saying that it was very cool because it wasn't intimidating in any way. Uh, they were already used to dragging and dropping different things. So maybe they're dro dragging and dropping jewels or any pieces from any other given games. And now they're just dropping you know, dragging and dropping a line of code. So what this did was very interesting because after you code, after you play this game, for maybe 50 to 100 uh, questions, problems, what you have been doing is reading good code. 
right? So you're learning how to look at the syntax, you're learning to the, the language logic, um, and you're looking at good code. So although after you play a while, you're not gonna be a Python programmer, it will help you feel more comfortable and confident when you start typing Python, as well as being able to somewhat decode uh, your code better and, and, and debug, it, debug it a little bit quicker. Yeah, and, and then that can make it a little bit more fun. And, and once we had the, the drag and drop stuff all working and we had content and we had the, the movies and the quest, then it started to open up some new opportunities, uh, such as looking at things like an iPad or an Android tablet. So last year, uh, we had a team of students at my university go off and take the same content and put it into, into an iPad app. And, and the idea being, uh, when you go to get on an airplane, maybe you could brush up on a language or try out a new language while you're on the plane. Or for students, maybe you're getting ready to go in and interview for an internship and you put on your CV that you know Python, JavaScript, and Ruby, and one of those you don't know as well as the other. So maybe you could pull out the iPad app, go through 20 or 30 problems, familiarize yourself with that syntax, and then you'd be a little bit more confident in the interview and hopefully make that interview a little bit more fun. And so here we have, uh, it doesn't show up as well here, it's a little bit dark, but lots of pretty iPad images. So a lot of that's still focused on this idea of the individual learner, like someone comes and they're motivated to try out a new language and they're going to sort of be doing it all on their own. But another thing that Sandra and I are very passionate about is trying to maximize the efficiency of that time you spend in a classroom setting or in a group setting like this, where you have time with your peers who are at the same level as you on your learning journey or with a qualified instructor. So we added this idea of tournaments. And tournaments, it's just like practicing, it's just like playing through a quest, except everybody in the room is solving the same problems at the same time. And as we launched this, we ended up uh, sort of zoning in on this idea of something we call tournament-based teaching, which is what I'll do is I'll come in and I'll start class with a short, fun tournament where we're going to solve 10 problems from last night's homework or the material that we covered last week. And so we'll typically start off, it's like a closed book competition. So those people who really know the syntax and come very prepared, they have a little bit of an advantage. And then after about five minutes, uh, we'll make it open book. Now you can go use Google, Stack Overflow, the Python documentation, uh, anything that you would use at home to solve problems, you can use in the classroom setting. You can setting. cheat in any way possible. And cheat in any way possible. Well, almost. Uh, and at that point, what we're doing is we're looking for our top 10 of glory. Those 10 people who can solve the 10 problems on their own before anybody else, right? And I will sometimes do some commentating or some kibitzing from the side. And as soon as we have 10 people finished, then we move into our peer-based learning portion of the, uh, the class, where those 10 who have finished, they go off and find 10 people who haven't finished, and they help them if those students or participa participants are interested. And then this continues on and on until we have more and more people finish, till finally you have each person uh, who ha isn't done has like a peer to their left or right that's there to help them uh, should they need that. And so as a classroom instructor or someone delivering professional training, this is really great because you always have some students that are really fast or pick things up quickly and other students that if you gave them all day, they might still not uh, finish on their own. So it's a very scalable way as an instructor you can sort of shorten that variability in the time it takes for everyone one to get done. And it lets your strong people get a chance to explain and mentor and, and, and gives other people more opportunity to work with uh, mentors. All right. So, so what we did, we, we noticed that the kids were having a really fun time doing these tournaments. It was really exciting. So what I wanted to do is bring it to the professional world. So we did our very first professional tournament at uh, PyCon Asia in 2010, and a Python user group gave us the grand prize, which is an iPad, and it was really exciting. We had uh, possibly 170 people in a room, we had 70 people playing, some of them were trying to hack us rather than playing, um, and, but others were playing, they were playing from their phones, from their iPads, from uh, their laptops, and it was really, really fun, people really enjoyed it, and so it was a really nice thing to see uh, professionals just enjoying coding. Yeah, and so that uh, first year, uh, I got to meet this gentleman who was a PhD student from Nanyan Technical University in Singapore, uh, NTU. Uh, I had never met this guy. I thought I knew the Python community, and uh, Singapore is not that big a country. We only have like 5 million people. Uh, and you know, here we are in this room with like 70 professional developers in the audience playing. Another 70 or 80 are watching. You know, I'm seeing Steve Holden over here playing in the largest laptop I've ever seen in my life back then. Uh, Wesley Chun is like on a mini 
computer on the side, right? And then this guy comes out of nowhere, and, and it was really great to uh, not only uh, you know award him with the iPad, but then get to introduce him to all of the hiring managers in the room, uh, and, and you know really gave him some credibility. So we got to celebrate him, and then we also had some secondary and third prizes. And actually, second prize was won by an, Aus an Aussie. You and Aussie, yeah, from That's right, Melbourne. You know, for, from Melbourne. So uh, so that was a lot of fun. So so fast forward to 2013, and our, our the the most recent tournaments that Sandra and I have done, we had a sponsor, Softlayer, who's a cloud computing provider. Uh, they gave us three prizes to give away to students. So a lot of our information system students, they have to pick up languages on their own because they're not actually taught as part of our curriculum. But we have a lot of great hackers who have learned some skills. So we started off by having this uh, JavaScript tournament, and uh, Ming Shang came out of nowhere. I think I'd, I'd seen this guy around, but I didn't really know him that well. I had no idea he was such a great JavaScript uh, hacker, nor did his fellow students. So we got to give him an iPad. Following week, we came back and we had a Ruby tournament. And uh, uh, Tommy uh, took the top prize there. And uh, being a great coder really opens up a lot of opportunities. So Tommy now is spending a semester abroad in the United States working in Silicon Valley because he's just a great hacker. And he did really well uh, on, on his interview with some Silicon Valley uh, company. So, so that was a lot of fun. And then the following week. Oh, this is my favorite. So this is a Java tournament. And it was really cool. It was packed. And people were just working on it. And then Xi Ling won the tournament. And it, it was awesome because it's the first time that a woman has won the top prize. And I'm not saying that, I know, I was so excited. Um, and I'm not saying that women are not as good coders as, as men are, but it's a law of numbers, right? 15 to 20 times more men come to the competitions and come to the tournaments. So just to see her there and encourage all her friends, and there was a line of girls, and they were all coding, and then she won. I mean, that it just encouraged all the ladies there, especially me. So I was really excited about that. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's been about three years since we've been holding these tournaments, and, and we call it celebrating awesomeness. Uh, if you find, a, if anybody gives you a prize and you'd like me to show up and give it away, uh, we should talk. I love giving away prizes. So we've held a lot of tournaments in Singapore, uh, a couple in the U.S. and in, in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, we gave away a MacBook Air at uh, PyCon in Atlanta uh, two years ago. We gave away a MacBook Air at PyCon Santa Clara uh, a year ago. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just been a, a lot of fun. And, and people yeah, you're missing a picture. In 2011, I believe, we had a Star Wars. Um, Star Wars is last year. Year Star before last, though, Jacob Kaplan Moss right. came to Singapore, crushed us all. He uh, did. Even though we were making you know, fun, I was, I was going over there saying, I'm going to retie your shoes, you know, all kinds yeah. of stuff. And he was still coding. He was laughing, but he was still coding. Yeah, we, we, were, we, were, yeah. we, were, we he, were giving him all sorts of grief. But, uh, but He won the tournament, but then gave his prize to the runner-up. So that was really He gave classy. it to the top student, actually. To the we're that's, that's, right. that's right. So if you ever see Jacob walking around, tell him that was a class act, giving a MacBook Air to uh, to, to 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 the student. Uh, so when we have events, uh, we have a couple of different uh, ways we do them. Usually, there's two rounds, and uh, the first round is typically a collaborative learning round, or it is a fun round. Mm -hmm. And so a collaborative learning round is no one's expected to know anything when they come in. Like, have you heard of Python? Do you know how to spell Python? Well, we're all just going to learn a little bit about Python by solving ten problems together. Uh, the people who pick it up quicker will then go off and help help the others, and it just is a nice way for some people to have a hands-on introductory experience to a language or a new library. And then we'll also do something uh, we call a fun round, and a fun round is just meant to be totally unintimidating so everybody could play. So if today we were doing a fun round, I'd say open up your laptops, and the problems would be very simple things, like make a function that adds two numbers together. Make a function that adds up all the numbers in an array, or something really scary like you know, let's reverse the characters in a string, right? Uh, but it's also a good way for people who are going to be competing in the prize round to warm up, to get used to the game, to get used to sort of the layout. And if you're not used to editing from the command line or in a text box you've never seen before, it's a good way to sort of practice that uh, as well. And then we move into prize round. Prize rounds are just meant to be prize worthy. We don't want them to be typing competitions that somebody gets done with in five or ten minutes. Typically, it's probably problems that are challenging enough that it's going to take 30 or 40 minutes for the top developer to solve them all, uh, give us plenty of times to pick at everybody and, 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 and maybe make fun a little bit. And
and then that top developer you know, will get awarded the prize. So the other idea is uh, there's lots of great hackathons and competitions. I've actually been a judge on a couple of uh, panels in Singapore, and there's, there's really good reasons to have a panel of judges for many types of events, but we try and focus on these types of events where there is no qualitative judging. It doesn't matter what you look like, it doesn't even matter how you dress, maybe not even what you smell like as long as you're not bothering people. Uh, you know, people come in, they solve the same 10 problems, whoever's the most efficient and effective, you solve the problems first, you win the prize, and you walk away. Most efficient coder wins. Now, even all of that is focused on this idea of finding the best coder in the room and sort of waiting till you're in the room to find that. Uh, but another thing that we've looked at doing is more of a team-based tournaments. And team-based tournaments, the idea is some people have more fun being part of a team rather than competing as an individual. So we'll divide people up into teams. And what we're pretty much saying is that when you come in, depending on the way the tournament's set up, it's, uh, for instance, up here, what this is showing is if the team with the top player uh, was to win the, the tournament, then, then team four up here, noted by the T4, uh, they would win. But if we were looking for the team with the top two players, then when the first person finishes, it would have actually been team eight, T8, because they had the two players that were ranked the highest. Uh, but what really gets interesting is when you play a tournament where you're looking for like the top three or the top four players. And so in that case, if it had been the top three, then team seven down here at the bottom, they would have actually won the tournament because they had the highest three ranked players. And so what happens is when you put people in teams, now before they come in, there's a little bit more mentoring and coaching that goes on. So you might have a great coder on your team and you want to make sure they get a shot at the prize. So if you're the, one of the weaker coders, you might study a little bit more. You might ask a few more questions. And at the same time, if you're a great coder and you want a shot at the prize, you might mentor your team a little bit more. And we also find it just makes for a lot more fun environment with people cheering for their team and it's really hard for people when the first person finishes to not help their teammates. You know, just sort of wait, wait for them to, to get done. Uh, so we've done tournaments like that. So what we're working on now, which is really exciting, this is our project that we're, do, we're working on. We want to do pair programming tournaments. So rather than individual tournaments, pair programming tournaments. But we don't want one person to have the keyboard and kind of take ownership of whatever they're coding. We want both people to have their laptops open and, and be programming. So some of the ideas are maybe we can do a map reduce. So one person will do a mapper and the other person will do a reducer. Or maybe they will do the same question at the same time. And maybe they can see each other's code or maybe they can't. Whatever it may be, um, these are just technicalities, but what I'm really excited about is what we're going to be able to use this in the future. So uh, once this is complete, we can do mixed double tournaments. Mixed doubles tournaments. And so what we can do is we can have a girl coder who wants to win the airbook, you know, the Mac airbook, and she's going to look for a guy that can win it with her. Or we can have a guy coder who um, has a friend that he thinks he can mentor and work with her to make sure that they win the, I don't know, the Xbox or whatever it may be. Um, and there are a lot of other opportunities as well. We can have professionals mentoring university students. So this is a really community building there as well. We can have university studi students mentoring high school students and build coding as part of the educational realm and the culture in a given area. Yeah, so we're really trying to set up these opportunities for peer-based learning, for mentorship, and diversity. So, you know, even here in this audience today, there's a lot more guys than, than gals, which is almost all the, always the case when I go to a technical conference. Uh, but if we have a really nice prize, like an Xbox 360 or a MacBook Air, I, I like the idea of the 10 or 15 guys who want to compete that now they have to go out and find a female coder mm -hmm. or they have to find a fellow student or a friend and turn them into a coder in order to even enter the competition and then we could get more of a balanced number of people in the room or, or the other way uh, I'd love to find what would be a great girl prize that would motivate girls to go out looking for guys uh, to help a coder maybe we could do like a manicure pedicure a little mani pedi gift certificates Absolutely. for your friends you want and I love this idea of like three girls you know coming up to a guy they know is a good coder and trying to get him to be on their pair, yeah. right? If you're a guy coder, you know, that might make being a coder just a little bit more cool. If it's not the car you drive or how much money you make, it's how well you can code. Yes. 
Yeah. So uh, once again, all this is just a few more ways to sort of extrinsically motivate people to um, try out coding, learn something new, try mentoring someone, try you know coming in, uh, learning from from someone else. And a as we look at all this, we're, we're also continuing asking ourselves, how do you do more of that sort of motivation with the, the carrot, with the prizes? Or I'm a professor, so I award grades, so I have a stick. Uh, you know, how do you balance that with the things that people are already intrinsically motivated for? Right. So that you can and have that nice bridge into letting people do things how they want to do it. So we have a lot of different ways for people to play and practice, and the idea is to really give them that autonomy. And at the same time, uh, we'd like people to feel like they're getting better, but how do people feel like they're mastering a subject? Uh, we, we talk a lot about that. And then finally, trying to just sort of bridge that gap so people can make the impact in the areas uh, that they're most uh, interested in, whether that's open source or building their, uh, their next startup. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, do let us know if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you. So is there any questions? Yeah. Uh, it's quite a minor question. Just um, So when you have the, comp the team competitions, um, and you're talking about where you're counting like the third player or something like that. So when the first player is completed, do they help the other players directly or do they only help before the tournament? Uh, so it, it's flexible. You, you can have it like that. So someone has to finish, then they can go into mentor mode, and you're not allowed to help your teammates until you're done. Uh, the other way is sometimes the first person who finishes, that might just mark the end of the tournament. So the rest of the team, it's however far along uh, they got. And like if the third person on your team finished problem seven before the third person on some other team, that would have given your team uh, uh, the win. So, so really flexible. The nice thing about creating games and tools is we can sort of put a framework in place that people can use to teach with and entertain with in a couple of different ways. The rules can change uh, for professional training. Sorry. Thank you. The rules can change to make it whatever you want to do. When I do professional training, is a, a, you know, depending on what the company wants to do. So maybe they can help, maybe they can't help, um, whatever it may be. So you, you can make it whatever you think is, is more fun. What has been the gender breakdown? Um, so we know that kind of participation of women in universities is somewhere between 15 and 20%. I don't know what it is exactly in Singapore, but at your events, does it tend to be above the average or tracking the average or below the average? So in a, a classroom setting, it'll be more 50-50 uh, because you know, it's not about the competition. But when we have a prize and people know that they're showing up to actually compete for the prize, we, we see that the more competitive it is, just honestly, the fewer, the smaller percentage of women is that's, that, that are participating. So in a fun round, in a collaborative round, there'll be almost as many girls as guys that'll show up like in a computer club or it'll be better than the computer club's average. If it is a fun round, everybody in the room will try out so you'll get almost every uh, uh, woman to play, uh, but when it comes to the competitive round, the numbers go, go way down. And, and hopefully that'll change over time. So um, talking about the autonomy, mastery, and purpose, I can see that these sorts of tools are very good for building mastery, at least at the early stages and moving forward. I was wondering, in terms of the feeling purpose and autonomy, whether you project some sort of roadmap or direction so that once they complete these missions, quests, and so on, that they can see a direction they can continue going in to, to go beyond the somewhat synthetic um, prizes and the extrinsic feedback into like now you have enough to actually create a Django app and start to control your own computer or your Raspberry Pi or whatever, as well as of course their career, to, to really um, drive them further, not just for the prizes but and not just for the peer accolades, but um, it can help them progress through the rest of their life. And the other thing I was going to mention as, before you answer is you really should look at the Diamond Age, which is another Neil Stevenson book, uh, which looks a lot at this um, assisted learning. It's a good read as well. 
Yeah, that, that's really the challenge, right? So, so mastery, it's, we, we can tell when people are getting better. It's like, how do you show them they're getting better without giving them another uh, metric, like an extrinsic thing that they're, they're trying to improve? Uh, autonomy, we, we talk a lot about it. It's just letting people know it's however you want to do it, right? There's, here's a lot of options available for you. You're really in charge. Or just do something uh, for fun. And, but purpose is quite difficult because that's just so many people have different purposes and you almost end up uh, trying to have a survey like, so what are you interested in? Why, why are you doing this? How can we help you today? Sorry, I was itching to answer this. So I have big dreams. Oh, I have big dreams. And I, I have, uh, my thought was, once the people finish the paths, finish levels, that we could give them bigger projects. Maybe from the open source community, introduce them to that type of stuff, and then possibly hire them out to do more projects as well. So I, I didn't want it just to stop at the game. I wanted it to be bigger. But this is where we are. Um, but yeah, the, the ideas and the dreams to, for them to continue using the tools that they have built uh, is essential, I think. Well, I actually have a question. Um, so, a lot of the questions, oh, sorry, a lot of the, um, the yeah, the, the questions in the in the game, um, are they very sort of self-contained, small small problems? Um, do you have any plans, or do you do you incorporate it in your thing to teach um, design paradigms and other sort of larger code um, problems that that like software developers face, um, but that they yeah, use as well? I think initially we'd like to get the mastery-based teaching stuff done first. I, I like this idea that once people know how to do uh, functions, they know you know how to do lists, they know how to do dictionaries, conditionals, those are some pretty powerful tools. So I think we'll focus on getting those basics down. Uh, in Singapore, uh, we, we work a lot with sort of big data projects. So, so getting someone where they can really understand just the basics of how do you make a mapper or reducer to go do some very interesting work, uh, that's probably where we're heading next. And then, then after that, where there, there's this sort of dividing line where a lot of people come with their own interests. They, they have certain types of projects they're working on. So we're probably just as interested in helping people move back off to their own interests as we are moving them deeper and deeper into a level of sort of design paradigms and patterns that they may or may not need for what they're trying to accomplish. Well, that's our time up for questions. Uh, Sandra and Chris. In appreciation for your efforts, here is uh, a blend each of uh, Norwegian blue coffee for you, and of course the PyCon AU mug Great. to drink it from. Okay. Please join me again in thanking Sandra and Chris Bush. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.